So uh, if you have your Bibles, you're going to need them today. Huh, we're going to we're going to bounce around a handful of places that you might notice in your if you're following along in your notes. There's quite a lot of scripture that we're going to be covering today. Um, now, normally what we would do is we would take larger chunks of Scripture and kind of go in-depth on those. We're going to go semi-in-depth on them, but we're going to be covering a lot more, so we can't go into quite the same depth as we normally would. Uh, and we're continuing what we did last week. So last week, uh, we started a, a very brief two-part series, so this will conclude us, called Don't Sacrifice Our Children. And last week we talked about the very difficult in our culture issue of abortion uh, and how that actually in many ways mirrored uh, some ancient Near Eastern practices, uh, particularly the, um, uh, the, the false Ammonite god called Molech, who was a, a really detestable kind of figure who demanded the sacrifice of small children. That's, you know, a picture of him right there, sort of an artist rendition. They didn't have cameras, so they couldn't quite do that. Um, but yeah, so we're going to continue talking about this idea of child sacrifice, but it's going to perhaps not be in, in the vein that you might thought. So our big idea for today is this. Just because we have not aborted our children does not mean that we're not still sacrificing them to ungodliness. Just let that sit for just a moment. So, you know, we who are Christians, who are firm believers in Christ, who look at the abortion issue say, well, obviously we reject that. Now, good. <laughs> we talked about that last week. We want to reject that. But uh, at the same time, on the other hand, there are many of us who without really giving it the thought it deserves, are uncareful with children in other ways, particularly regarding letting the enemy get his hands on them. And so we're going to talk about some things today. Uh, okay, so I'll start with a, actually a, a number for you. 70 to 88 percent 70 to 88 percent of youth children in Christian homes leave the faith by their freshman year of college. This is uh, from a study done by the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, there have been multiple studies that have very, very similar results. 70 to 88 percent of youth in Christian homes leave the faith by the end of their freshman year of college. Now, a lot of us will look at that and say, college is the problem. College is not the problem in this. It is part of the problem in many regards, but in a lot of ways it's actually a catalyst that points back to a much longer running problem. Let's talk about how we train and educate our children. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. So the scripture tells us very flatly, look, part of what we need to make sure we're doing as believers is training our children in the way they should go. And that's not just, hey, be polite. That's being in connection with God, loving God, worshiping God, doing the things that God calls his people to do. This is what you what the world would call religious training. But it's also moral training. It's spiritual. It's moral. It's a lot of different things. So the Old Testament says this. The New Testament puts it this way. Luke chapter 6, verse 40. A disciple, or the, the word disciple means student. That's all that word means. A disciple is not above his teacher. But everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. 
So when you see Jesus, for example, traveling around with his disciples, part of the mindset of that is that the disciples look to their rabbi, look to their teacher and say, our desire is to be like our rabbi, is to be like our teacher, which may, example, for example, explain why Peter thought it would be a thing that he could actually get out of the boat and walk on water, because he saw his rabbi doing it. Right? Otherwise, it seemed like, well, that's a strange idea, Peter. Why would you do that? Because that's the mindset of a disciple. As I see my rabbi, I see my teacher doing something. I want to be like my teacher, so I'm going to do what I see my teacher doing, not just learn the information my teacher knows. Okay? So these are two kind of biblical principles that we want to start with when we talk about the training and the education of our most vulnerable among us, our children. Children are sponges, mentally. They just, for the longest time, absorb, absorb. Have you ever said something around a kid and they repeat it and you're like, no, don't say that out loud. <laughs> right? Because that's what they do. They, they look at the world outside of them and the people outside of them and then they begin to just pull in. And when they see and they've attached themselves to a particular person like a mom, a dad, or a teacher. They do what teacher does. They do what mom does. They do what dad does. This is the beginning principle. This is who we are meant to be and what we are meant to do. We are meant to bring up our children in the Lord. Any contention on that one? Does that seem to make sense to everybody? Right. The Bible says it. Let's just not argue against it, right? And yet, I think we do. In many ways, I think we actually, in practice, avoid doing this. Now, just one, one thing I want to point out here about Proverbs 22.6, that very first word, train. Every parent trains their child, whether they, whether they intend to or not. Training happens in your home and outside of your home. Because of what we said earlier, they look at you, they emulate, they do what they see you doing. Okay, that's important. That's a good starting point. We have to understand this is what we're meant to do. We're meant to train up our children in the way they should go. Point number one, God expects Christian families to train children in godly wisdom. This is what the expectation is. This is what God says you ought to be doing this. Train your children in godly wisdom. Our first scripture that we're going to be in is Proverbs chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles and you want to follow along, Proverbs chapter 1. And we're going to read verses 1 through 6. We're going to read verses 1 through 6, but we're not going to stop there. We're going to come back to Proverbs 1 in just a moment after we establish a couple of things. Proverbs chapter 1, starting in verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. To understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. Now, as we look at those first six verses of Proverbs chapter one, I think something stands out. The, the, the thing that stands out is what the ideal is, the thing that we're aiming for, and the thing that we're aiming for is inculcating in our our children the wisdom of God. That's what this is pointing towards. Who here wants to be wise? Just go ahead and raise your hand. Okay? 
Great. And you don't have to raise your hand for this next question. Who here feels like they're hitting that? Why? I see a lot of smirks, and I know what those smirks mean. Yeah, I don't feel like I quite hit that. Why? Well, why? That's a, that's a rhetorical question. <laughs> We've got a lot of ground to cover. All right, so why? Proverbs 1, starting in verse 7, picking up in 7, 7 through 9. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching, for they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. So, Right there, we're told who ought to be the primary instructors of godly children. Godly mom, godly dad. That's what the scripture says here. God ordained fathers and mothers to be the primary, not only, but the primary trainers of their children. Verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commandments, making your ear attentive to wisdom. Chapter 3, verse 1. My son, do not forget my teaching. Chapter 4, verse 1. Hear, O sons, a father's instruction. Chapter 5, verse 1. My son, be attentive to my wisdom. Chapter 6, verse 1. My son, if you have put up security for your neighbor, etc. Chapter 7, verse 1. My son, keep my words and treasure up my commandments within you. Who is doing the teaching in Proverbs? Chiefly, mom and dad. Chiefly, mom and dad. Is that what is happening in our culture? Is that what Christians are allowing to happen in their culture? Are we always the chief trainers of our children today? No, no, we're not. No, no, no. Where, 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 do, where do kids spend during the school year approximately eight hours a day? public school and when they come home mom and dad will sometimes say what did you learn today what's the response well you all know this because you've all heard it maybe you've all said it by the way that response is not true they learn they learn Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not stray from it. Why do 70 to 88 percent of youth in Christian homes leave the faith by the end of their freshman year of college? Is it the college's fault? Partially. Partially. But not entirely. Not entirely. The question is, God or, or the point is, God ordained fathers and mothers to be the primary trainers of their children. The question is, are we doing this? Are we doing this? Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. Because it's not just about making sure you take a little bit of time, making sure they sit for 40 minutes in Sunday school. This is the description of what that training actually looks like. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house 
house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. That is the description uh, or the proscription of the training regimen that God expects godly moms and godly dads to participate in. God ordained parents not simply to train their children, but to train them rigorously and thoroughly. Rigorously and thoroughly. The description and proscription in Deuteronomy chapter 6 is kind of a all the time sort of thing. It's not, there's a chunk of the day where you kind of sit down and debrief with your son or your daughter after they come home from public school and you try to maybe talk with them a little bit through some things. So the question is, are we doing this? Are we doing this? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Godly parents are commanded to raise godly children. Can we outsource godly training to an ungodly source? Is that feasible? Does that make any sense? No. No, it does not. No, it does not. Point number two. Countless children in Christian homes are sacrificed on the altar of a secular education. A secular education. Colossians chapter 2. It's very helpful here. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. See to it, which means be active and intentional about this. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Okay, a couple of things to point out here. Colossians 2.8, generally speaking, is written to adults, right? Uh, it's for the entire church, it's for everybody in the church, but the primary people who are going to be ingesting this and then hopefully putting it into practice in their life and hopefully using it to train their children are grown-ups. A couple of things to observe about this. See to it that no one takes you captive. The implication here is that a firm, thoughtful adult is potentially able to be taken captive by deceit. That's a, an adult who has some ability to think well, whose mind is hopefully trained to spot something false. Think about a child who just absorbs what is around them. This is a scary warning in that regard. See to it that no one takes you captive through bad philosophy and the elemental things of this world and not according to Christ. Ungodly stuff, secular stuff. Pagan stuff. Secular education is designed, the secular education of today, is designed to train children to leave God out of their thinking. And it's been that way at least for a hundred years. They have been working on this for a hundred years. You can go back and you can open up articles by the periodical called The New Republic. And you can see them discussing how do we get God out of our schools? 
it's not, it was not a secret that they kept. It wasn't even a behind the scenes. They were open about it. And today we see the fruit of their successful mission. 70 to 88 percent of youth in Christian homes leave the faith by the end of their freshman year of college. Secular education is designed for that. Proverbs 13, 22. Proverbs 13, 22. Or 20, sorry. Proverbs 13, 20. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. But the companion of fools will suffer harm. It matters who you spend time with. It matters who you allow your children to spend time with. It absolutely matters who you allow to train your children for eight hours a day. For eight hours a day. This has been their open strategy since the 1900s. Their open, obvious, clear, forthright, stated strategy. How do we get people away from God? It's worked. It's worked. That's what... Have you ever thought... You look at the world and you go, how much crazier can this get? How much more insane can this get? Stop saying that. They're taking it as a challenge. <sighs> Has anybody here ever read? It's a small book by C.S. Lewis called The Abolition of Man. So uh, he wrote this book in the 1940s. He wrote it in 1943 is when it was published. And the reason he wrote it, or the thing that sort of kickstarted it, was actually just a series of three lectures that he gave. But the thing that kind of kickstarted it was he was, because he was an educator, he, like, he was, he was a, a tutor at Oxford and Cambridge and stuff like that. So he was sent a, a, a piece of material that was meant for children in their school to use as grammar. And he received it, and he began to read it, and he grew steadily horrified with it. 1943. And this is what he has to say about where education was going. In a sort of ghastly simplicity, we remove the organ and demand the function. We make men without chests and expect of them virtue and enterprise. We laugh at honor and are shocked to find traitors in our midst. We castrate and bid the geldings be fruitful. That is his assessment of where education in the world is headed. Now, he's a Brit. Okay? He's in England. But the same thing that was happening here was happening there. And that is his assessment of the trajectory of where education in the secular world was headed. And it's, it's, it, I cannot imagine what his assessment would be if he looked at today's secular school. Now, I heard you use a phrase, public school. I don't use that phrase because it's not open to the public. It's run by the government. Call it what it actually is. It is a government school. It's a government run school. It's civil. It's institutional. Public is not the right word to describe it. So, but then the, you know, the, the well-meaning response that comes out of this, but isn't the church doing something about this? Is, doesn't the church counter this with things like Sunday school? 16,000 hours 
That is what the average child spends in a government institutional school. 16,000 hours. How many hours do you think the average Christian student, if they show up every Sunday, spends in Sunday school? Neighborhood of 600 hours. That is vastly outbalanced. Vastly outbalanced. And I'm a churchman, okay? I'm a church guy. What, what are we doing in those classes? Well, the vast majority of churches around our country, what, what are they doing in those classes? Here's a picture of Noah's Ark to color. A lot of it's entertainment. A lot of it's what? Ping pong. ping pong. Yes, there can be some of that. Not that ping pong is bad. Not like ping pong as much as the next guy. But is it training in godless, godliness? No. Or, or if it is, it's exceptionally shallow. And we wonder why. We wonder why. Seventy to eighty-eight percent leave the faith by the end of their freshman year of college. Now, now there's a lot to say there. <laughs> we must stop supplying the enemy for soldiers to use against the kingdom of God. Flat out, that's what we have to do. We have to cut off his supply. Well, when, when you are waging war, when one country wages war against another, one of the things that is a strategic move is to cut off the supply chain so that they can't feed their army, so that they can't continue to muster their forces, so that they can't keep their army together. That's what's been done to us. Except for they haven't cut off our supply. We've given it to them. That's the main thing that actually has been happening over the last hundred years or so. We have got to stop supplying the enemy with soldiers to use against us. We have to. Now, there's a variety of ways that that can happen, okay? So, point number three, what is the strategy? Seek a distinctly Christian education alternative. Seek a distinctly Christian education alternative. Now, variety of ways that that can happen, and a lot of them, I understand, are costly, But are you willing to spend your child instead? What resource are you most interested in preserving? Your bank account or the soul of your child? That's not an exaggeration. That's a serious question. A distinctly Christian education alternative. Psalm number one. Psalm one, verses one through two. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Blessed is the man who what? Removes himself from the setting where the temptation and quite frankly, the training to do that which is wrong and against the way of God is prevalent. What's the first strategy? The first part of the strategy, strategy is this. Pull them out. 
pull them out. Remove them from the context. What's the second part of the strategy? Well, this is where some diversification is a, is a possibility. So the possibilities that are in front of us are send them to a private Christian school, which, yes, is costly. I worked at one for a while as a maintenance guy, which is funny because I'm horrible at maintenance, so I don't know how that happened. <laughs> But I, here's what I will tell you about my time in the, the Christian school. Not a whole lot different than the public school, to be honest. I think that's probably the, one of the least desirable alternatives. Put them in a Christian school, or a, a, the general sort of Christian school. There's a kind of second, a, a kind of alternative Christian school that I would recommend if it's a possibility. Now, the closest one to here, as far as I can tell, is about an hour and a half away, which makes it sort of hard. But I'm going to put it out there anyway. A classical Christian school. Class is anybody familiar with what classical education is? Classical education is a yes. My child raised her hand because she goes through it. Okay, not in a school setting, but in a homeschool setting, which I'll talk about that in just a minute. But a classical Christian education is an education that trains children classically, which means we don't just simply separate subjects that are somehow all disconnected from each other. Everything is integrated together. And the way in which children are trained in a classical education setting is vastly different than what you will see if you walk into your typical public school, if they would even allow you into the first place. And you will also see a, a, a striking difference in the way that students react in that setting. They actually seem engaged. My kingdom for that. But then here's what, here's what we do as a family. And here's what I think this is. It's hard depending on the circumstance. But just because something is hard doesn't mean that we don't do it. One of the, one of the phrases that we repeat in our homeschool co-op is, I will try new and hard. Hard things are difficult tasks. I will try new and difficult tasks. Classical education. Actually, I was able to answer that out loud and not, I don't know. I will try new and difficult tasks. And so the, the one that I kind of advise most strongly is educate them at home. Educate them at home. Now, all kinds of red flags go up for all kinds of people on that. So I want to share some numbers with you on this. 90 to 95 percent of Christian homeschool students remain in the faith throughout college. That's a marked improvement from losing 70 to 88 percent. 90 to 95 percent of Christian homeschool students remain in the faith through college. 78 percent of peer-reviewed studies on academic achievement show homeschool students perform statistically significantly better than those in institutional schools. <coughs> Way better. Like it's not even close. Homeschool students score above average on achievement tests regardless of their parents' level of formal education or their family's household income. Here's what that means. They've tested this and they've seen that a parent who stays home and educates their child, a parent who has not even had a high school diploma, who has not graduated high school, still their children far outstrip institutional schools in terms of achievement. So this is the thing that, you know, was probably the hardest thing for me to overcome is I don't feel like... I'm geared or able to do that. I, I don't feel like I'm trained to do this. Which, let's say something about that, shall we? If your public school, your, your government school education didn't prepare you to pass on the same information to your children, why on earth would you put them back into that? Does that make any kind of sense? It's logically nonsensical to do that. 
If you are not prepared to pass on what you received, why would you expect it to be any different with your kids? Why? Well, it won't. 87% of peer-reviewed studies on social, emotional, and psychological development show homeschool students perform statistically significantly better than those in conventional schools. Which means the, the, the typical thing that gets thrown at homeschool families is, well, yeah, but you're not socializing your children. Okay. That's nonsense. I can promise you that. My, ch my kids are far better socialized than your average public school student. Far better. And let's talk about the socialization that they get in their public school setting, shall we? When was the last time you were with people strictly your own age for eight hours a day? Has that ever happened since you left school? Like military, which let's compare military and a, and a conventional school setting and see how those things stack up to one another. Because one of the things that you'll find in a military setting is that the, a lot of the, the junk that was accumulated during a conventional school setting has to be burned out of them. The lack of discipline? Yeah. 87% of peer-reviewed studies, social, emotional, and psychological development. Because we're not just saying, Johnny, go be with 25 other eight-year-olds for eight hours a day. He who walks with the wise will become wise, but the companion of fools will come to harm. It matters who you spend the most time with. It matters who you spend the most time with. So, the question that I think is of a very important one that has to be addressed is, all right, what if there's no alternative? Valid question. What if there isn't a classical Christian school that's close by? What if there isn't? I, I, simply, there's no way to afford it. What if I'm a single mom who works two jobs and can't do the homeschool thing? Because that's a possibility. What if? Here's, here's my answer to that. Okay. But then be prepared to work harder than you ever imagined you could to obey God's charge to train godly children in your home. Because you're going to be spending so much time countering the godless stuff that they pick up in a conventional school. And honestly, you're going to be working so hard at that, so hard at that, that why not put that energy into finding a way to do the homeschool thing? Why, why not seek that? Now, is any of these alternatives, the Christian school alternative, the classical Christian school alternative, the homeschool alternative, are those things absolute cures? No, of course not. That's, that's why the first statistic that I shared in the second set was 90 to 95% of students trained in a homeschool setting retain their Christian faith throughout the entirety of college. There's still a missing number there, isn't there? There's still going to be people led astray. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not stray from it, is not a guarantee. It's a proverb. Proverbs are sort of generalized statements. It's not going to happen in every single case. But why mess with it? Why mess with the way that God in the scriptures says this is the preferred way? Now, I know personally many people who work in the public school system, the government school system. I know several, especially from our first church. Our first church had a lot of people 
who worked in the school that was right across the street from the church. What was fascinating is when Abigail was born, it was starting to become kind of of school age. One of the, one of the librarians from the school was chatting with Rachel and said, so, you know, kind of what's your, what's your plan for schooling and stuff? And we knew by that point that our plan was to do homeschooling. And here we are in a church that has several people who work in the public school system. <sighs> well, here we go. Well, our plan is actually to homeschool her. And the relief on the face of that librarian was stark. Like, oh, that's such a good idea, she said. Because I can't tell you how many problems we have with students in our school. Even an insider can see the problem. Even insiders can see the problem. So in your bulletin, there's this little orange sheet that I gave that has a list of resources. You can go ahead and look at that if you want. Um, uh, I want to highlight, so I brought three out of the four books that I referenced. The Abolition of Man, I talked about, I quoted once so far, actually another quote from it in a second here coming up. The Abolition of Man by C.S. Lewis, I don't know what happened to my copy of it, I cannot find it. I guess I have to get a new one. Um, but, so there's a lot of good stuff here. I want to highlight one book in particular. This book is called The Battle for the American Mind by Pete Hegseth. It came out last month. I cannot tell you how valuable a resource in understanding the problem this book is. Like I went through it, I actually listened to it first in Audible. I had an extra credit, Audible credit that I needed to get rid of because I forgot to cancel. So I said, well, I'm going to look for something. And I just stumbled across this one. And I thought, well, that, that looks interesting. I'll, I'll get that. And, I, and I, I, the first chapter, and I'm like, I, I have to listen to that again. And so I've, I've, I've listened to the book all the way through once, and I, and I was telling Rachel about it. I said, you've got to listen to this book. She goes, I don't listen to audiobooks. So I, like, I bought her a copy. <laughs> okay? That's how important I think this is, is to have multiple copies of it in our home. <laughs> there is so much good in front. If I could put a copy of this in everyone's hand, I would. There is a lot in here. It's very revealing about how we got to where we are today in our secular education setting and what we do about it. And it, it, it's in many ways an apologetic for classical Christian education, which our homeschooling method is classical Christian education based. So we try to make sure that both of those things, we not just train them at home, but we bring them up in a classical method. That seems to be the best thing for getting training, godly training into children that we have seen. A lot of online resources here. A lot of the stats and stuff that I shared with you today are from that first one, uh, NHERI, the National Home Education Research Institute. A lot of good stuff there. Uh, classical Conversations, the third one down, that's the homeschooling method or uh, one that we do, and there's a couple of other ones there. But I've got all of that stuff here in case you want to take a look at one of them. But here's C.S. Lewis, one more time from The Abolition of Man on his statement, another statement that he makes on the education system that at that time was still in, in its secularness, is still in its infancy stages. 1943. So think about that as you think about, well, how far has it progressed to today? C.S. Lewis, The Abolition of Man. The difference between the old and the new education being, in a word, the old was a kind of propagation, men transmitting manhood to men. The new is merely propaganda. That's how C.S. Lewis characterizes the trajectory of education in 1943. That trajectory has borne some nasty fruit. There was one thing I was very briefly considering sharing with you and going over it that is a uh, education tool, if you want to call it that, that's used in elementary classroom education settings, but I was too horrified to bring it. So I'll just have you go look for it if you want. Go look up 
the gender unicorn. It is a real tool that gets used in classrooms to help children understand the fluidity of gender. Elementary classrooms. That thing needs to be chucked right into the pit of hell from whence it came. The only perfect burn. It's bad stuff. Let's close, though, now with Lewis. I love Lewis, but let's close with the scripture, shall we? Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. Close with the words of Jesus. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 19, therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do, so, to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Handing over our children to a system specifically designed to get their thinking off of God covers the first part of that verse. Just sit with that. Just sit with that. Our children are too vulnerable, are too important to hand over to someone whose design on them is to obscure any thinking about God and set up an idol in their life so that they're worshiping something that is not God. Because that's what's happening. Gender unicorns and the like are false idols that are beginning to become rampant in our secular education setting, beginning with our very youngest. Drag queen story hour? Are you kidding me? The first time I, th I saw an article about that, I thought I was reading the Babylon Bee, the, sat the Christian satire website, and it wasn't. And I was horrified. Do not allow the world to take hold of our most vulnerable and twist them. Yeah. One more agenda that's being yep. nationwide. Yep. Critical, critical race theory is a massive problem. And that's actually, so that's tied in a lot with the gender stuff now. Um, Go read, and here's another resource, Fault Lines by Vody Bauckham. He covers that in detail and absolutely dismantles the critical race theory stuff. Covers the history of it, covers the meaning of it, covers all of that sort of stuff. Absolutely. Um, yeah. We have a copy of that in the church. We do have a copy of Fault Lines in our church library, by the way. That's absolute. Thank you for reminding me about that. Yes, we do have a copy of that book. I cannot recommend it enough. Vody Bauckham. I can share that with you afterwards, too. Um, real interesting guy. All right. Let's pray, because we need it. Father.